Hello congregation, family and friends. I pray that all is well with you. Welcome to this edition of Bible Study. Uh, today is going to be part one of a two-part series. I originally was going to make this all into one study, but the more I was looking at it today, the more I realized there's no chance that I'll have this in one study. And so today's going to be part one of a series that I am calling Mustard Seed Faith. What does that mean? Well, we're going to look at several passages today uh, with regards to the parable of the mustard seed. If you have your Bibles or if you're taking notes, we're going to be moving around a couple different places today. We're going to be looking in the Synoptic Gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're essentially going to read almost the same words, but each writer is a little bit different, and I'll explain that after I read all three of them. And so what I want to do is this for part one, as we start to understand what does faith as a mustard seed really mean. We're going to look at the actual parable today of what Jesus said, and we'll look at it from three different perspectives, Matthew's, Mark's, and Luke's. We're going to compare the different verses and the different words that they use. And then I'm going to give you what it means in a, in a translated way. And, and the difference between what they understood then and what we would understand today. It's all the same thing. But I'm going to show you in a modern context exactly what Jesus was talking about. And so if you have your Bibles with you or if you are taking notes, we are going to be starting in Matthew 13 today. And we're going to be reading verses 31 and 32. I'm going to read that and then I'm going to go right to Mark and I'll give you the reference and I'm going to go right to Luke. We're going to read all three of them in a row so that you can hear the difference each one. Most of it's the same, but you'll hear little subtle differences, okay? So if you have your Bibles or you're taking notes, we start in Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32. This is what it says. He presented another parable to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, when a man took, which a man took, and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. That's Matthew's account of the parable of the mustard seed. When we go over here to Mark, go to Mark chapter 4, verses 30 to 32. Here's the way Mark phrases this same thing. And he, Jesus, said, How shall we picture the kingdom of God, or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the other seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. And then finally, the same parable was told in the Gospel of Luke, and we need to go to Luke 13, verses 18 and 19. So he, he meaning Jesus, he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew, and it became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. So there's the three readings, and I'll bet you, as I was reading them, or if you were following along in your Bible, you recognize several phrases and several things that were identified identical, I should say, between all three parables. But then you saw subtle little differences. Now, let me just ex explain two things before we actually go in and I explain to you exactly what this parable was saying. Because maybe you've never understood it before. Why would Jesus be talking about a mustard seed that grows up into a tree and then the birds fly into the branches? What is that all about? And how does that relate to our condition of salvation and believing in Jesus? Well, actually, it does. So there's two things that I want to explain to you before we uh, get into the interpretation of what this parable is. Number one, we have to understand what is a parable. What is a parable? Well, as I've explained before, and you probably already know this, a parable is a story that uses earthly elements or earthly things that we can identify with. But the greater meaning is not an earthly meaning, it's a heavenly or spiritual meaning. In other words, a parable is an earthly story that has a spiritual or heavenly meaning. 
And as you read through the, the parables that Jesus is talking about, even with this mustard seed, he is identifying things that people then, and even us, we can identify with. A tree, a mustard seed, uh, sowing and reaping, uh, planting, growing up into uh, bushes and plants. All these things we can understand from a human perspective, from an earthly perspective. But is God, is Jesus really saying to us, giving us a parable about we plant a little bit, a little seed and it grows up into a big tree and the birds are launch and sit in its branches. Is that the end of the parable? Is that all it means? Because if so, if we're only interpreting it that way, then it, how does that relate to our spirituality? So that's the number one thing. We must understand what a parable is. Number two, we also have to understand that as God gave these men utterances and holy utterances second peter i believe it's second peter says that the holy spirit gave holy men of old utterance and he gave them what he wanted them to write but you know what he did he gave them each allowed them to use their own personalities and so that way you don't have every gospel that reads exactly the same some gospels add a little more detail than another gospel and we're going to actually see that today there's one or two writers that will leave out a particular phrase or a particular word this is the fascination of actually doing bible study of digging in and seeing what the gospels and all of the bible really says and so as we're going to break this down i, I made a, a little chart so you don't have to keep going back and forth if you just want to take notes and look at all this later on so there's two things remember before we get into this that we have to keep in mind number one that a parable is an earthly story that has a spiritual or a heavenly meaning okay so we're going to see this parable on two levels Number two, God allowed each man to use his own personality in writing, and so all the writings are not identical. They are going to be a little bit different. Now, having said all that, here's what we want to do. What does having mustard seed faith really mean? Well, I hope between today and next week when we present part two of this, that you will have a much better understanding of what faith is. Now, if you were with me last night, we started off this week with Monday Night Manor, last night, edition number 29. And I had told you at that point, if you had seen that, that God really laid on my heart that this week I should just be talking about faith and different aspects of faith. And so last night we were looking at Hebrews chapter 11, and we looked at a few verses there to determine exactly what faith is. And then we saw a couple of the early uh, people like, well, who was it? It was Abel and it was Enoch. And we were looking at their level of faith and how God gave them faith. And it was actually the faith of Jesus that sustained them, not our faith. It's not your faith and it's not my faith. It's the faith of Jesus Christ within us. And so we looked at that last night. And so tonight and next week, we want to look at mustard seed faith. So here we go. Again, if you're just joining me, the three references are Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32, Mark chapter 4, verses 30 to 32, and Luke 13, verses 18 and 19. We already talked about a parable. So here's what I want to show you here. When you go back to Matthew, let's break all this down. I want to start at Matthew here, okay? In verse 31 of Matthew 13, it says, He presented another parable to them. He, meaning Jesus, parable, which I just explained what it was, saying the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed okay when you look at matthew matthew uses the phrase the king of heaven but mark and luke use the phrase the kingdom of god now why would that be does that mean they're the same thing or there's something different i've heard arguments actually on both sides some people say no the kingdom of heaven is one thing and the kingdom of god is something else the bottom line is we're seeing even in this parable they are synonymous they are interchangeable whether we're talking about the kingdom of god or the kingdom of heaven it is still god's kingdom it's not Satan's kingdom. He has his own kingdom, the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of darkness. And so when we see kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, I don't want you to be alarmed saying, oh, they must be talking about two different things. It's interchangeable. It's the same thing. And that's why I want to point these differences out to you. So Matthew says the kingdom of heaven and Mark and Luke say the kingdom of God, but they are one and the same thing. But let's talk about this mustard seed now, because 
Jesus uses the words, the actual phrase, the actual item of a mustard seed in all three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He says here that it's the smallest of all other seeds. At that time, it was the smallest seed known to man at that time. It was the smallest one at that time. There may be smaller ones now. And he's looking at the mustard seed. So when we're looking at interpretation, what does the mustard seed represent? It represents the gospel. And I'm going to show you as we go through this parable for the next few minutes exactly why that is. The mustard seed is the gospel itself because it's something that's planted and it grows and it grows and it grows. And you're going to see by the end of this parable in a few minutes, hopefully, you'll understand exactly why we identify the mustard seed as the gospel. And by the way, in one of these accounts, it says that these trees can grow over 10 feet. We'll look at that in a little bit too. So let's go back to Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. So he's equating. He's saying the kingdom of heaven is just like a mustard seed. Well, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is the gospel. It's the gospel that Jesus was preaching, that those that come to Jesus have eternal life, have forgiveness of sin. We become children of God. We become children of God's kingdom. We become children of God's heaven. And so we can see how that is fitting together. If We're talking about a mustard seed. I hope you can see that. Now, verse 31 in Matthew 13 says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Well, Matthew says it's a man, Matthew and Luke. When you go over, and Mark doesn't say anything, I don't believe. Let me look real quick, because I don't think he says that here, and I want to be accurate. It is like a mustard seed which when sown. Okay, so Matthew and Luke, I thought I had that right. Matthew and Luke mention a man, when a man sowed. Who's the man? It has to be Jesus. Because if we're talking about the gospel and the, and the mustard seed represents the gospel, then the man who is doing the sowing has to be Jesus Christ, our Lord himself. So let's go back and look at this and stay with me. I realize that this might be... Um, I'm throwing a lot at you, but that's the benefit about these. You can go back and watch them again and again and again, because I have a lot to get in in this first session to be able to explain to you exactly what this parable is so that we can set ourselves up for next week when we actually look at a bigger picture of what mustard seed faith is, and we will be looking at a different passage. So let's go back and look at this. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is just like a mustard seed who a man took and he sowed into his field. Now we have to we have to look at it and we say okay a farmer, you know, a, a farmer would take seed, plant it in his field, water it, cultivate it, it grows, he harvests the seed, he harvests the plant or the fruit or whatever it grows. We can understand that from a farming aspect, from a natural aspect. But Jesus is going higher than that. He's giving us a spiritual picture that we need to capture and we need to see this. And so the man that's spoken of in Matthew and in Luke is clearly Jesus Christ. And in Matthew, it says he sowed into his field. In Mark, it says sown. And Luke says something strange. It says throws. He throws. Who is doing this? It's Jesus. Jesus is the sower. He is the man who is sowing or who has sown or who has thrown into his field or into his garden. It is Jesus that's doing that. So we finish off this verse here. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Now, when we look at the word field, in Matthew, it says field. In Mark, it says, upon the soil. Do you remember we were just got done reading all these? And in Luke, it says, his own garden. Again, these three men were using their personalities. God was allowing them to use different characteristics to speak in their own language. And But essentially, they mean the same thing. What does the field or the garden or the soil represent? Notice in Luke, it says, his garden, Jesus' garden. Notice it says his field in Matthew here. It says his field. Whose field? It's Jesus' field. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the field is comprised of all of the people around the world throughout history 
who have come to receive Jesus as Savior. That's the field. Remember, in another parable, and I don't want to get us confused, we talk about the parable of the sower. We may have looked at that before. I'd have to go back and check the uh, video log. Talk about some seed falls on hard ground, some falls on very fertile ground, and it takes root and it comes up. Okay? Jesus is the sower. He's out there sharing the gospel. Some people are going to come to believe on the gospel, and other people will not believe on the gospel. And so the field is really the world. The field is the world, but it contains only those people who are actually going to come to Jesus. The, the message goes out to the whole world. The gospel is available to everyone. The field or the soil or his garden, however you want to look at that, depending on which of these translations you're looking at, whether it's Matthew, Mark, or Luke. One says field, one says soil, one says garden. They all are synonymous. They mean the same thing. It's the world. But when we break that down, it comprises of only those who are actually going to believe in Jesus. Why? Because some people will come to truth and some people will not. The field is ripe for harvest, Jesus said. And, and will God send laborers into the harvest? There's people all around the world, in every nation, in every part of the world that need to hear the gospel of Jesus, that need to hear the salvation message. That's what they need to hear more than anything else. And so the field is ripe for harvest. The mustard seed is sown. It's sown into the field or the garden, and it starts growing. So hopefully you understand the interpretation of that. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous, mean the same thing. A mustard seed was the smallest seed known at that time. And a couple of these interpretations or explanations say it was the smallest seed. And that's significant. And I'll show you that in a moment. A man took it and sowed it in his field or in his garden. Jesus came. He brought the gospel. He sowed that seed into people. He started sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that I preach, the gospel that every faithful Bible teacher and preacher preaches. It's the gospel that Jesus preached. Nothing else, not added, nothing added to it, nothing taken away from it. It is what Jesus preached, the gospel. And so he's planting this into the field. Now watch what happens. Verse 32 of Matthew 13, and this is smaller than all other seeds. We just talked about that. It is the smallest. It was the smallest seed that was known to man. Matthew and Mark mentioned to us that it's the smallest seed. It says, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. When it's full grown, Matthew says. Mark says, when it becomes larger than all. And Luke says, when it grows or as it grows. Same thing. It means the same thing. Mark is saying when it's, Matthew's saying when it's full grown, when it's fully grown. Mark is saying when it's larger than all else. What does that mean? It's when the gospel spreads around the world. Remember, it starts as a mustard seed. It starts as a tiny little seed. And then what happens? It spreads all around the world. And even today, as you and I are sitting here, Christianity is alive and not so well because we're being persecuted in many places of the world. But it is alive through the sons and the daughters of God, through the children of God, through all of us that preach and teach the gospel, through all of you that pray for other people, those who share the gospel with others and give our testimony. We attend church. We support pastors, etc. Christianity is still growing. The seed that started out small has now grown. It's grown worldwide. There are believers all over the world. There's more to come. That's why Jesus is not back yet, because not everyone who's supposed to hear the gospel has heard it yet. Otherwise, Jesus would be here. He would be here and gone already. And so if you're looking at this picture, he's saying the smallest little seed, now when it's full grown, when it grows, and these, these little seeds can grow way past a plant, way past a shrubbery. They can be as tall as 10 feet high and they can sprout branches. And we're going to look about, we're going to look at that in a moment. And so look at this, Matthew 13, verse 32. This is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, when that gospel reaches all the world, it is larger than the garden plants and it becomes a tree. And that's the next reference we have to look at. It becomes a tree. Luke says it becomes a tree. Mark says it forms large branches. See the tiny mustard seed, as I was just saying, which grows up to be a tree. What does that symbolize? How do we interpret that? It symbolizes Jesus' offering of salvation, of refuge, 
of protection within God's kingdom. See, the tree in the Old Testament, if you read through the Old Testament, the tree in the Old Testament was a symbol for shelter, of protection, of refuge. It was, it was a symbol. And Jesus is using the symbol of a tree, not a literal tree. Remember, this is a parable. He's giving us an earthly example that has a heavenly or spiritual meaning. We have to look for the heavier spiritual meaning rather than just a tree on the earth. That's not what Jesus is talking about. We see the picture of a tree, and those that he was ministering to, those that he was preaching to, would have understood the significance of a tree. We look at a tree, and we see it's magnificent, it's beautiful, it sprouts leaves, but how do we understand that? Because we know Jesus is not just talking about a tree, and even then, he wasn't talking about a tree. Now, you may wonder at this point, and I don't want to get too sidetracked, why did Jesus talk in parables? We'll look at that sometime. Jesus does explain why he talked in parables. It may seem kind of unfair that we have to unravel these things, but you know what? That's what Bible study is all about. If you only read the Bible just once and closed it and said you thought you knew everything, you didn't do Bible study. You really got to dig in. You got to spend a lot of time, diligent time, digging through the Bible to making sure that what you're hearing is true, just like the Bereans that I always talk about. So let's get back to this. When it starts as a mustard seed, it starts with one person. It started with Jesus bringing the gospel, and then it went through his apostles, and then went into foreign lands, different lands. Now it's spread all around the world, and people like you and I do our part in sharing the gospel. That tree is still growing. The branches are still growing. And that's what Jesus is talking about. The tree is a symbol for Jesus' salvation, his refuge, for our protection in God's kingdom. But look what happens. Because it becomes a tree and it forms branches, it says the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. All three of these, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all say the same thing. The birds of the air come. All three of them. So who are they? The birds represent all of those who hear the truth of the gospel, and they come to Jesus and the refuge he offers us. You see, if the field is the world and the tree grows as Christianity is growing and it flourishes and all of these branches come out, what does that tell you? The birds come and settle in the tree. It's all of those people like yourself and myself that have come to truth, that have trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. We are literally, figuratively, not literally, of course, we are figured to leave those birds sitting in the branches. And because there's so many branches and because the tree is so big, there's room for you and I. There's room for a lot of people to become saved. It's not some small little bush that kind of came up out of the ground that's one inch high. No, this is a magnificent tree that started with one little seed. It started with Jesus coming to earth and sharing his gospel and then going out through the apostles and out through people like Paul who went into the... Uh, Gentile nations, and it keeps spreading even today. It's still spreading. Even as you're on this broadcast here, we're still hearing the same gospel today that Jesus was preaching then. And the tree is growing, and the branches are there, and more and more birds are coming into the branches. More and more people every day are getting saved. Every day are getting saved. There's more and more souls coming into the kingdom. So let's finish this up because I'm, I'm watching our time here. It says it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. That's what Matthew says. Mark says they nest under its shade or protection. And Luke says it nestled in its branches. Again, all the same thing, whether it's nesting in the branches, nesting in the shade, or nestled in the branches. And what does it mean? It means to find comfort, to find peace, to find protection, to find forgiveness. There's so many branches there's birds coming from all over. Even today, as the gospel is going out all around the world, there are still birds flocking to this tree. If we can use this metaphor, if we can use this example, then the tree that Jesus planted, which is his gospel, that has all of these branches on it, there are still people coming to truth and resting in Christ, resting on the branches of his gospel, if I can say it that way, resting in the hope that Jesus Christ and only Jesus gives us eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and entry into heaven. And that's what the parable is all about, the parable of the mustard seed. 
Now, what we're going to be doing next time is looking at, let me make sure that I looked at everything. Yeah, I want to make sure I looked at everything. And so I got two questions I want to leave you before I give you a, a, a hint of next week. Are you resting in Christ? Are you one of those birds that's in the tree? Are you resting in your salvation? Can you rest and have peace in your heart to know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that all of your sins are forgiven, and that if you were to die today, you would go to live and reign with Christ in heaven? Is your faith in Christ, is it growing like a mustard seed? Through your years or maybe weeks, however long you have been saved, do you see your faith growing like a mustard seed? It started small. And the more you read the Bible, and the more you study scripture, and the more you attend church, or befriend other Christians, or serve under a minister, whatever the case may be. Is your faith growing like that mustard seed where it's coming up through the ground and it starts shooting out branches? Are you growing in your faith? That's the questions I want to leave you with. Do you have what I'm calling mustard seed faith? I pray that this study, and I know it was heavy, and I know in 25 minutes or so I, I threw a lot at you, but that's a challenge for you. That's the good thing about Bible study. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Let me move this out of the way because I want to say goodbye in a couple minutes here. If this has been a blessing to you, God says in Isaiah 55, 11, he said that his word does not return void. It reaches all those people he intends it to reach. So if it reached you today, if this meant something to you, if you learned something today about this parable, maybe you never understood the parable of the mustard seed before. Now you do. I would encourage you to share the broadcast with someone else. Let someone else also see what God has to say in his word. If you know of someone that would want to hear this, please feel free to share it. I mean, that's what it's all about. We're here to share the word of God with each other. The other thing I would say to you is this, be a Berean, Acts 17, 11. You're probably tired of me saying this, but if there's nothing else you ever get from me, get this. The Bereans were more noble than others. It's not because they were smarter or better or more privileged. It says that they received the word with all readiness of heart. They were open, their eyes and ears and souls and hearts, their minds were open to what Paul was going to preach to them. They heard the gospel from the apostle Paul and they were receiving it, but they didn't stop there, you see. They did one step further and thank goodness they did. They then searched the scriptures daily to make sure what they were hearing was true. I encourage you, do the same thing. Everything that I taught you today, everything that you learned today, go and study it for yourself and make sure what you're hearing is the truth. Nobody is a perfect teacher. I strive and do my very, very best with diligent study to only bring, to teach and preach what I believe the Bible is saying and what I can prove the Bible is saying. I don't do things maliciously. I don't make things up. I don't sugarcoat the gospel. I don't change things around. I don't pull verses out of context. We just go right into scripture. We read it. We study it. And we present it as God presented it. And so, but you owe it to yourself because I, I even saw someone earlier today. I'm not going to name who he was. But I, I saw someone earlier today that just was writing the most blasphemous, ridiculous things. Had absolutely nothing to do with the gospel of Christ. I had to wind up blocking him. Because I will not have certain things that coming on my timeline or certain things that I know are absolutely not true and not in line with God's gospel. I will not have them because then, then you, if you're following my timeline, you see it. And then I'm responsible for allowing that to be on my timeline or show up in a video or something like that. And so I'm constantly looking. Whenever I hear a sermon... Whenever I hear a Bible study, I go just like I tell you. I take the references down. I go and I look and I study and I make sure that what I heard was the truth. Sometimes it can be an honest mistake on a particular position or, or, or phrase or something. But I'm talking about being very careful about those that deliberately are out to deceive. And they are out there. The more you know the Bible, the more you study it, the more you seek the Holy Spirit's illumination, the easier it's going to be for you to see who's a false teacher, who's a false prophet, and who isn't. It becomes very obvious, very quick, who is telling the truth and who is not telling the truth. Be a discerning, diligent Berean. Study the scriptures. Take every reference down that you hear and make sure it lines up with what God says. You'll be very surprised at what is preached and taught today that's not even in the Bible, and you can't find it in the Bible. Be very careful. Lastly, would you please pray for this ministry? We covet your prayers, and I thank all of you who have been praying for us. We feel them.
But we do need your continuous prayers because this ministry, as many, are under attack. We're under satanic attack lately. And that's because Satan does not like the things that I preach. I happen to be one of those preachers who's really bold, a little bit loud, kind of forceful. I don't sugarcoat or, or uh, soft soap anything. You're not going to get a sugar-coated gospel here. You're not going to get just certain selected verses that make you feel good with no conviction, no deliverance, no repentance, no nothing. If that's what you're looking for, this isn't your ministry, this isn't your channel, and I'm not your preacher. And so because of that, Satan would love nothing better than to shut us down and put us off the air for good, stop me from going into local pul pulpits, stop me from traveling and sharing the gospel. He would love nothing more. And so I please, I pray for your prayers, I ask for your prayers that we would stay strong, no retreat, no quit, no backing up. We're not going to stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ as long as there's a breath in my body, whether it's on social media or in the pulpit, wherever he calls me, as long as I'm able to do that or until, until he calls me home, this is my calling. This is what I do. I've been doing it for years. I want to continue doing it, Lord willing. Please pray for us. If you want to see our website, it's livinginharmonyministries.org. You can stop by there and see some things. We have a new website that's going to be up and running uh, after January 1st. But for right now, this one is good, livinginharmonyministries.org. If you feel led to support us financially, I'm not saying you have to. This is not one of those ministries that you have to pay for prophecy. You don't have to sow a seed to get a miracle back. That's a bunch of nonsense. That's not the way it works. That's not what God says. Be very diligent about that. But if God would ask, lead you to support us financially, we sure could use it because there's no salary here. There's no big money rolling in. There's no corporate sponsorship. Um, this is a walk of faith. And so if God would lead you to support us financially, we sure could use it. And it would go right into keeping the programs on the air and sharing the gospel. There's two ways, three ways you can do it. One is right through our website. Um, livinginharmonyministries.org. Second way is right here through Facebook Messenger. It's quick, it's easy, safe, and secure. It takes less than a minute and it's done. The third way, if you want to mail something into us, we do have a corporate address, which I can give you if you message me privately and you can do it that way. But I leave that between you and God. If you don't feel led to support us financially at all, we still ask for your prayers. And we would still ask that you come back and see us. I'm on the air four or five times a week. Please come back and see us. Share the video. I pray that you are blessed. And next Tuesday, Lord willing, we will do part two of what I'm calling mustard seed faith. Thanks for being with me. God bless you.